We have reached episode 25 of Dragon Ball GT, and here the series returns to Earth. This also marks phase 4 in how I perceive the shift GT makes in its return to Z-era battles. If the first two phases slowly and subtly introduce a new villain, and the third phase marks the point at which the adventure and the villain are balanced, here's where the balance dramatically tips in the opposite direction. While Baby infiltrating Earth becomes the dominant focus, the main four characters only appear in five scenes across the next three episodes. As if to draw the most striking contrast between the two stories, while the stuff with Baby continues to be body horror nightmare, the cutaways of the gang collecting Dragon Balls are presented as cartoony as possible. I'm not even exaggerating, all the classic cartoon bits make appearances. Goku tricks an alien tiger off a cliff. The tiger doesn't fall until realizing they're suspended in air. The tiger creates an animal-shaped hole in the ground. Pain is represented by circling cartoon birds. And this is all accompanied by the soundtrack slowly dying, as if someone unplugged the jukebox. Goku blows a hole through a dinosaur, which results in nothing more serious than the dinosaur deflating and then patched up by adhesive bandages. It's silly. You know, I really want to say something about how poorly Goku treated this innocent dinosaur when he could escape Ma Jr. without damaging him, but it's silly. I want to say something about how the Dragon Radar is established as not having the capability of sensing a swallowed Dragon Ball, but I, I don't know if silly is enough for me on this one. That bugs me. If there is any purpose in establishing Giru was created as a Dragon Radar, though, maybe it's in justifying this. The heroes throw a party to celebrate their one remaining Dragon Ball. Goku, however, is disappointed that the looming threat of Baby has seemingly disappeared from his life. Boy, do I have news for you. What's striking about this, though, is that the scene is framed through the literal lens of Pon's video diary. I love this concept. I feel like we needed more of this. I would have loved to have framed this arc through Pon's insight into the journey. Hear her thoughts, capture their feelings. It would have added so much energy. Alas, we're a bit late to this, but it's better than nothing. Narratively, this shift in focus is important. Demoting Goku, Pon, Trunks, and Giru to a B story isn't simply done to provide humor in between Baby being Baby. With the gang finishing up their Dragon Ball hunt, they are going to be returning to Earth. Shifting back to Earth before they do allows us to find out what's going on and what kind of Earth they will be returning to. That world will be a shock to them, but a thrill to us as we know it's a trap. And because of our time and space, we also know far more than what the characters on Earth know about the threat they're facing. You know what I love about Toei Dragon Ball? No, seriously, I'm not being facetious or setting up some kind of cruel reversal. Do you know what I love about Toei Dragon Ball? Toriyama Dragon Ball is great for speedy pacing, for getting to the point, for never letting things drag. Toei Dragon Ball, at its best, takes the time to stop and smell the roses. It's not always about getting to a place to do a thing. There are opportunities for character dynamics to bounce off of each other, a chance for the audience to catch its breath, time to make the world feel fleshed out and lived in. This is the first time Dragon Ball GT features the characters left behind on Earth since the beginning of the series, so it's a perfect opportunity to relax with them. It's an important reintroduction to characters we haven't seen, but also establishes a contrast to what they will soon become. Goten and Chi-Chi have made their way into the city, Goten has a big date, Chi-Chi is worried about him spending time with city girls while Bluma encourages him. It's all pretty cute. And then, there's Vegeta. Good on GT for not only giving me a Vegeta that doesn't send me into a blind rage, but one whom I actually think is the best part of any given scene. 
from chopping off the steering wheel of guys hitting on his daughter, to his absolute breakdown over his daughter not liking his mustache, to his pride at having shaved off his mustache, to his embarrassment over Chi-Chi noticing his lack of a mustache, to his annoyance at Goten not noticing he shaved off his mustache, y you know what, just anything having to do with his mustache. There's a fantastic balance struck here. Vegeta definitely still feels like Vegeta, but he's no longer the entitled man-baby he was stuck as for so long. Even when Bluma and Chi-Chi laugh at his mustache, and Vegeta grumbles that he's going to kill them, I get to think it's funny rather than worry he's actually going to do it. Speaking of mustaches, I can't think of a better note on which to begin the 1996 Dragon Ball fashion extravaganza. Like with the end of Dragon Ball, there are too many characters here for me to cover them all. I'm going to spread this out across multiple videos so that fashion is not all I'm talking about today. You've probably noticed that I've been less than impressed with some of GT's original designs, but here's the thing. When it comes to our existing characters, it's Toriyama who designed them. Yes, that includes Mustache Vegeta. Which brings us to... Mustache Vegeta! What can I even say about this that hasn't already been said? This look is Freddie Mercury mixed with a serial killer, mixed with a midlife crisis dad, mixed with a vegetable. The flat top hairdo, the mustache, the varsity jacket, the khaki slacks, everything about this look is an absolute nightmare. Somehow, none of it goes together. I can't hate it, though. It accomplishes what it clearly sets out to do. You know exactly who Vegeta has become the second you look at this. He's a dad. He's a lame dad. Who peaked in high school. That is hilarious. I'm not even judging here. Let him live his best life. What I find fascinating, though, is how quickly Toei says, No thanks, Mr. Toriyama, we are out of here. This Vegeta only appears in one episode before they decide to do away with it. They take the first opportunity to not only change the design, but to draw as much attention as they can to the fact that they are ditching that mustache. It's the first thing that happens in the episode. Even the characters have to make it a point to talk about how much the design sucks. The perfect file recounts how the anime staff were shocked by Toriyama's design. Every moment of this is throwing Toriyama under the bus and apologizing for ever trusting him. To an extent, I get it given that Vegeta, kinda, is going to take on a more serious role. But if the first design is, I'm just a dad, midlife crisis, then the new design screams, I'm more than just a dad, midlife crisis. This tries so hard to look cool. All black, fingerless gloves, cut off vest, tank top, leather pants. Oh, Vegeta, you're such a cool dad. Again, not judging, I want him to feel his best, but he's clearly leaving the PTA meetings early so he can throw down with the Jets. The story establishes it has somehow, amazingly, been nine months since Goku and the others left for outer space. According to Chi-Chi, that means they only have four months left until the Earth explodes. Wait... Did the writers make a mistake, or does Chi-Chi think there are 13 months in a year? That can't be right. Oh, no. It has been eight months since they went into space in Dragon Ball Dissection, so you know what? I think Chi-Chi's right on this one. Goten has traveled to Satan City for his date with Pallas. He buys her soft cream, which she's never had before and doesn't really understand. She doesn't seem to understand much of anything. They're sheltered, and then there's knowing less about a common dessert in the city in which you live than a boy who literally grew up in the mountains. Goten seems to really like them dumb, though, and is insistent on keeping her that way. I'm guessing he doesn't want a girl smarter than he is. Even when Palace notes smoke in the distance, Goten only cares about introducing her to hamburgers. Bimbo meet himbo, it's a match made in heaven. 
That brings us to Son Goten in the 1996 Dragon Ball Fashion Extravaganza. <sighs> I'm sorry to have to say it, but this is a whole lot of nothing. It's the most basic shirt, the most basic pants, and a bad Yamcha haircut. This is so empty and forgettable that if I look at it for more than a few seconds, he literally disappears. If you're gonna be a himbo, do it with some style! Sorry, but shaggy-haired Goten was so much better looking, and I wish we'd spent more time with him. But this Goten is rocking his mid-90s cell phone holster. So cool. Proving that Satan City Banks only exist to be robbed, a Satan City Bank is being robbed. But amazingly, that's not the real problem. While the robbery is in progress, another guy enters who looks a lot like Dolph Lundgren. But he's not here for the money. He wants to know where the Saiyans are, and his eyes glow red. He roughs up the robbers and blows up the bank. Uh-oh. Thankfully, Mr. Satan is here to save the day. I love that the camera pans up past a giant sign of the younger Mr. Satan to clearly demonstrate that he's not quite in his prime anymore. I only have one fashion note for him. I don't want to comment on the ravages of time that we must all experience. However, the one way he's changed since the end of the last series is that he's decided to connect his mustache to his sideburns. I mean, it's technically impressive. I'm just not sure why he'd want to. When Dolph asks him about science, Satan wonders if he's talking about those delinquents who dye their hair blonde. Dude, your son-in-law is half Cyan. This really shouldn't be tripping you up anymore. Dolph is as displeased as I am. Goten wanders onto the scene, proving he's at least smart enough to be able to walk and breathe at the same time. Mr. Satan decides the best way to save face against laser eyes is to pass off Goten as his pupil. Goten objects until he sees Dolph chatting up his girlfriend. Then it's game on. However, Palace says he only asked her where to find a Cyan, and she was about to point him in the direction of a vegetable grocer. Wait, so Palace doesn't know what a hamburger is, but without any context, she's able to work out a Dragon Ball pun? You know what? Maybe this is my kind of girl. At the mention of Saiyans, Goten finally begins to take this seriously. However, Baby has gone full I Am Legion as more and more members from the crowd start to attack him. Eventually, Baby shows himself, a little taller and a little less naked than the last time we saw him. Baby recognizes Goten's key as similar to Goku's, cluing Goten in that this guy knows his dad. The fight begins, but even now Goten is more interested in looking cool to Palace chan She calls him on his cell phone, and he not only takes the call, but has to lounge around to prove it's no big deal. Given the state of the city, it's hard not to feel this is a bit callous on his part, but it is charming enough that I can let it slide. To everyone who complained in the Boo arc that Goten was simply an extension of Trunks, these episodes are doing a good job of creating a distinction between them. I can honestly say this is the first time I've seen a Dragon Ball fight interrupted by a phone call. This gives Baby an opening to Nick Goten. Annoyed at being embarrassed in front of Palace Chan, Goten transforms into a Super Saiyan. Baby exposits that when a person raises their key, it frees their body and gives Baby a chance to infiltrate. Well, good to know, good to know. Um, what was that little boy doing then? Baby flies into Goten's cut and takes him over. Honestly, I really like the idea of Baby needing to cause damage and goad his opponents into powering up in order to take them over. It creates a tangible signifier that clues us into the impending danger. But as they've already shown Baby get into people without them powering up or suffering cuts, what's the difference? How are we supposed to feel that suspense if Baby doesn't actually need those conditions? I just feel like this shouldn't be hard to keep straight. Goten is now sporting evil eyeliner. Unlike with Trunks, Baby realizes he can read Goten's mind. That's impressive, given that I wasn't sure Goten had a mind to read. Because of this, Baby discovers there are other Saiyans in the Western Metropolis, and the strongest one is Vegeta. 
Baby reasons that if he takes over Vegeta, he'll have enough power to surpass even Trunks or Goku. <laughs> wow, sucks to be Goten. He's just a stepping stone. Even Trunks is considered a far loftier prize. At any rate, Vegeta is the key. Now, Baby knows he has slipped into Goten's body undetected, and the best way to keep the deception going is to stay in character as much as possible. But evil's got a evil, so he treats his friends like dirt before flying off. Sure enough, that raises suspicion. Gohan and Videl arrive at Capsule Corporation prior to Goten's return, because Mr. Satan informed them that Goten was wounded and acting weird after an incident in Satan City. This sets Chi-Chi off, who was already panicking over Goten's city girl date. By the time Goten arrives, everybody is ready to give him the most attention he's ever received in his life. Good job. Now, up to this point, GT has done a fantastic job here building up goodwill with me. The action is fun and tense, the characters have been written engagingly. Because of that, it breaks my heart that they completely ruin it here. Chi-Chi immediately gloms all over Goten, but he's only interested in finding Vegeta. Chi-Chi beats the ever-loving crap out of him because he's not polite enough. Gohan enters, Goten sucker punches him, the two brothers go off to beat the crap out of each other. And Chi-Chi reacts like this entire sequence of events is perfectly normal. I just... Uh, what? Look, there are so many different angles I could criticize this over. I don't think Goten failing to use the proper level of politeness in constructing his sentences is justification for his mother literally knocking him into furniture. I don't think Goten's super strength keeps this from being abusive. And I just don't think any of this is funny. But, you know, that's just me. This doesn't work for me for all of those reasons, but maybe it does for you. And it doesn't mean some of these ideas couldn't work within a different context. I don't want to get bogged down with any of those things because they're not as important as the overarching problem. See, while Toei Dragon Ball is great at giving us slower, character-focused moments, they can so often get derailed by overemphasizing traits to absurd degrees. And that's what's happening here. The characters aren't reacting like people do. And even that would be fine. After all, Goten taking a phone call is cartoon logic. But these people aren't even acting consistently with how they were written 30 seconds earlier. Look at this from Chi-Chi's perspective. She just learned her son was injured to the point that family needed to come check on him. Her concern for Goten's safety has bordered on obsessive. But all it takes for her to completely forget about everything she was just told is for Goten to call Vegeta, Vegeta instead of Vegeta-san? Seriously? Given all of that context, if I was in that situation, and he started acting aggressively, my first thought would be to worry he'd suffered head trauma. I'd be pushing him to see a doctor, not inflicting another concussion on him. This is ridiculous. In fact, she has a much more believable reaction when he straight up shoves her. Oh, but leave an honorific off and you're gonna get smacked across the room. I've pointed out before that one of Toei's go-to gags is to ramp up Chi-Chi's unreasonableness. But the last time she was this violent is when Garlic Jr. infected her with the Aqua Mist. This time it's Goten who's being possessed by an evil entity, but she's the one acting like a demon. It makes no sense. I mean, one of Goku's most notable character traits is speaking impolitely, and he's the main character. So why isn't Dragon Ball this violent all the time? Oh, right. And it gets even worse when Goten picks a fight with Gohan. Chi-Chi plays this off as, oh well, boys will be boys, seemingly already having forgotten both her anger at Goten's unforgivable rudeness and her apoplectic fear over Goten's safety before that. Am I the only person who thinks Goten punching his brother for no reason is a far greater social faux pas than a lack of politeness? I'm not saying that siblings don't get into fights, 
I'm not saying it isn't reasonable to assume this is how these brothers blow off steam. What I'm saying is, is that there's no context that would cause anyone to shrug this off. Baby is not being remotely subtle or crafty about any of this. If he was smart, he'd make up some rhetorical excuse. Hey you, I remember what you said about me at the blah blah blah, and I'm not putting up with it anymore. It wouldn't make any sense to Gohan, but it would be enough to make everyone else assume, well, something must have happened that we don't know about. Instead, he's just all, we're gonna fight now. Once again, my first thought would be that he'd suffered brain damage, and we need to break this up. Baby doesn't have to go to any effort to trick these people because they're already so stupid. I want to at least give Gohan credit in that he immediately picks up that something's wrong. Good for him. But it shouldn't be because he's a genius. It shouldn't be because he can sense the evil due to years of special training. Any idiot should be able to look at this situation and immediately know something is horribly, horribly wrong here. Chi-Chi is stupid, but she doesn't have the memory of a goldfish. I honestly think this is the worst writing I've ever seen in Dragon Ball. The characters are reacting so illogically to simple stimuli that it would honestly make me feel better if someone told me it was written by a chatbot. Since we're here, let's check in with the 1996 Dragon Ball Fashion Extra Alvaganza as it pertains to Videl and Gohan. Videl has clearly been raiding number 18's closet with this new denim look, but on her it reads much more hip mom than teen delinquent. That and the hair give me the impression that she shops at Trader Joe's and eats quinoa. And I'm totally cool with all of that. I will say though that while I don't dislike it by any means, this is probably my least favorite Videl hairstyle. If you know me at all, you know I like braids. But I also like face framing. The pulled back hairline just looks so severe. I get angry vibes from it. She needs some bangs. Everybody needs bangs. That's my first decree as ruler of the world. Everybody gets bangs. I don't think her end of Dragon Ball flapper hairstyle was especially in character, but it made her look happier, more fun. As for Gohan, well, yuck. At least the couple matches. Gohan's hair is even more severe than his wife's. It's so sharp I'm sure I'd lose a finger if I touched it. Even Goten's hair is better than this. But I'm used to adult Gohan having bad hair. Maybe some brave soul will come along 25 years later and finally give adult Gohan a hairstyle that doesn't make me want to vomit. What really kills this for me is the jacket. I hate this jacket more than is reasonable. I admit it's irrational, it's stupid, it embarrasses me to feel this way. It just makes me angry. For him, it looks so uncomfortable and awkward. I'm not even wearing it and it makes me itch. It's also just ugly. What is this weird cut? Why does it zip? Where are the lapels? I mean, like with Vegeta, I get the message it's sending. Gohan is a boring, generic adult, and this is the most soulless jacket I could ever imagine. But at least Vegeta's look provides some semblance of fun. Just talking about Gohan's look is giving me anxiety, and I have to move on. Before I go, though, my friend Lady Zeon suggested that perhaps Toriyama meant for it to be a cardigan and Toei just misinterpreted it as a suit jacket. If I think about it in that context, it looks a little better. I'm calm now. Returning to the story with that calmness, let's pretend that a logical sequence of events happened. Goten returned, played his role well enough that no one grew suspicious of him, and managed to trick Gohan into being alone with him. Or Goten returned, didn't bother trying to trick anyone, and behaved in such a violent and erratic manner, more than just not being polite, that Gohan felt he had no choice but to get him away from the rest of his family. Whew, isn't that so much better? Doesn't that seem like what they wanted to do? 
Gohan has figured out that something has possessed Goten. Goten admits to it, and they begin to fight. There's a disconnect between them, though. Baby can tell that Gohan isn't going all out, and wonders if he has deduced the new rule that the victim needs to power up to allow Baby in. But Gohan is simply worried about not hurting Goten. There is a cool idea here, that Baby is so cruel, so alien, that the idea that Gohan would be concerned about his brother's well-being simply doesn't occur to him. But at the same time, Baby can read Goten's mind and understand these dynamics. It's the whole reason he played along and didn't simply knock Chi-Chi into next week the second she started behaving like an unhinged lunatic. Like the rules of infection, like the whole stupid Chi-Chi scene, it comes across like the writers are just going with whatever seems coolest at that exact moment without any kind of thought or planning. It's also worth noting that as shirtless, glassesless super science, it's really hard to tell the brothers apart. Fashion extravaganza. At any rate, Baby finally pushes Gohan into enough of a corner that Baby jumps into him. But it's okay, because Piccolo is here to get to the bottom of all of this. And, and, and then Gohan blows him up. Okay. Bye, Piccolo. Glad Furukawa got paycheck. Despite it running into some problems in the second episode, I still enjoy how the show is building tension. It's about to complete that transition from adventure to pure fighting, and it's doing a good job of it. Like I said last time, the macro story is good. These are fun episodes, and I enjoy them enough that the second half of the second episode isn't enough to ruin them. Goten's intentionally written stupidity works great, but Baby could be doing a far better job. He completely nailed blending in and gaining trust when he was the doctor, so why can't he do it here? It's hard for me to wrap my head around this idea that a character has to be pumping out key for Baby to get them. Even ignoring all the non-combatants he's lived in, that wasn't the case with Trunks. That there needs to be a cut seems to be a rule invented just to force some more fights to happen, rather than Goten laying low and snatching Gohan while he's asleep. And then they ignore the cut rule with Gohan anyway. I marvel at writers, especially those on a weekly deadline. I don't want it to come across like I don't respect them. There are legitimately so many good ideas here, but they get all mixed up. I don't know if this is a result of having to push through the grind, or if there simply wasn't a strong enough hand guiding the writer's room on a consistent path. Pick a direction and stick with it. That's all they really needed to do. So that's it for now. If Baby can get his hands on Vegeta before Goku and the others get home, his plan will be complete, as will Phase 4. Baby is slowly but surely pulling more people to his side, and that's scary for me because I need those people on my side. Don't fall victim to Baby's Patreon. Please support mine instead. I give out fun stuff and early access. Baby just causes you to get slapped by your mother. What kind of reward is that? The choice is clear. I will see you next time.